Hello, Julian Simpson. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. I'm a big fan. Could you give us a brief biography of yourself, please? Yes, but this is kind of unrehearsed. So um, <laughs> <clears throat> I've been working in TV and film uh, here and in the US for a long time now. Um, I've worked on stuff like Doctor Who here and Spooks and more recently written a bunch of since like, I don't know, 2010, 2008, maybe started doing audio drama for the BBC and ended up doing Lovecraft Investigations and the Aldrich Kemp series. Um, fourth season of Lovecraft Investigations is out now. Third season of Aldrich Kemp is coming out towards the end of next year. Uh, but I haven't written it yet, so I can't, mm -hmm. there'll be no spoilers about that. Um, and yeah, I just, I write things and direct things. You seem to have an interest in the strange and the paranormal, especially for the old radio dramas. Um, yeah. So, so what was the I, kind of impetus to kind of blend that with, with things like radio storytelling, I guess? Well, so um, that was a good question. And that's actually one, it's kind of one of my hobby horses. You'll be, you know, so <clears throat> your listeners have got to buckle in now, I guess. But it's, um, <laughs> I uh, recall, and I have specifics, but I remember being a kid and listening to ghost stories on the radio. And I remember them being far scarier than anything I was reading or watching at the time because audio specifically for the supernatural has a power that uh, other media doesn't have, at least for me, which is that you bring your imagination to it. So I'm not showing you a monster, which can only ever really be a bit disappointing. Um, I'm letting you conjure the thing that you're frightened of and let that exist in your head and let that be the mental image that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it works unusually well for audio with the supernatural. I think actually the supernatural and spooky stuff is by far and away the best stuff to do on audio. We just don't, for whatever reason, seem to do very much of it. Yeah, do you think that's the BBC maybe say, thinking, oh, there's not an audience or? I think I think we've proved there's an audience and I think that and I think Danny Robbins has proved there's an audience as well. I think that uh, I mean, BBC is a difficult one because they have a limited number of slots. They have a limited budget for drama and their drama budgets have been cut year on year since forever. So, you know, the breadth of drama that they might like to be doing is just not possible within the the, the resources that they have. Um, there's some good spooky podcasts around, and there have been for a while. Tannis was a big oh, favorite. Oh, Tannis. Tannis um, is great. <clears throat> Tannis kind of led into the first series of Lovecraft investigations mm. in a lot of ways. Um, and the black tapes and, and that stuff. And I think, um, but I don't, it's weird. There's not enough of it, but I guess... It's a bit like horror movies, right? I don't watch a lot of horror movies, but I've been watching some recently because it's been Halloween and stuff. 90% mm -hmm. of them are pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably true of spooky audio as well. And that's why it doesn't get the kind of take up because if you listen to a couple and they're not very good, why would you continue? Yeah, a lot of filmmakers will do a horror film as their first film, won't they? So it's kind of like, it's almost like, it's, it's like a rite of passage. And they well, have to it's get that through thing it. of, you know, five teenagers go to a cabin and get killed one by one is one of the cheaper mm -hmm. things to do. But it's also like it's Billy Wilder said that no one ever walked out of a whodunit. And it's it's sort of similar with those kind of movies. It's like if you make that movie for a price for a, for a, on a low budget, then there are enough people who just want to be entertained by a slasher pick that you've, your audience might actually put you into profit. Whereas if you try and make The Usual Suspects or Reservoir Dogs to take two very bad examples because they're both successful, um, your audience is not built in. No, no. But as I saying that, there are very good horror films as well. Uh, Amazing you know, horror films, yeah. yeah. What kind of like horror would you say influenced you? Um, so from when I was a kid, The Omen, the original Omen, The Shining, 
Uh, the Exorcist, although I went back to it recently and I didn't like it as much. I hadn't mm. seen it for a while. That's probably an unpopular thing to say because I know everyone <laughs> loves it. Um, uh, and then if we're going way back, there was a movie called The Medusa Touch oh, yeah. that uh, with um, Richard Burton and Lee Remick that was, to my mind, aged... <clears throat> maybe 11 or 12 the greatest film ever made and then when it came out on blu-ray and i watched it again i was like oh no it's really not <laughs> it's really quite bad i had that experience with love- batman with the original you know the first batman tim with burton Chuck film spray. Yeah, oh God, it, yeah yeah it's, it's yeah you just think at the time that batman film when it came out was such Revolution. Oh, you're talking about the Tim Burton one. You're talking about the, yeah, Tim, the Burton. Tim Burton one. Yeah, sorry, the Tim oh, Burton yeah. one. Yeah, dreadful film, but it yeah. seemed like I remember getting buying the graphic novel, the T-shirt, the baseball hat, everything when that movie came out. Loved every second of it. Yeah, and, and then you watch it. Stand up at all. It's kind of unwatchable. <laughs> yeah. so, and I suppose yeah. also with uh, horror films, it, within horror, you can explore themes which you can't necessarily explore or which aren't so easy well it opens itself up to being explore exploring lots of different themes uh within that it's like you can explore you know like hammer in for example and comedy funny enough they 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 were allowed because they did it on, uh, to present things to the general public which if you did it in a, a straight way it would be completely unacceptable so like in the vampire lovers you've got lesbian vampires in it if you said right we're going to make a film about lesbians that would be it, when it was made it would be unthinkable absolutely yeah and, and, and so, it's also, so, so the censor yeah, I mean, the censor allowed sort of a you know it went you know allowed it you know um at the time so. yeah and 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 you've got stuff like more recently um the invisible man dealing with domestic violence and stuff and um yeah you can you can but it's also i think it's kind of an interesting playground to deal with things that everyone's frightened of or are in some way taboo and it sort of seems to put a little protective kind of curtain around it to go it's okay to think about this stuff for an hour and a half Mm. now it doesn't need to be who you are it's like my partner she only likes she only lets me watch horror with her in the living room, <laughs> um, in, in a particular time of the year, for some reason, like in the summer, she refuses to watch horror, but over the winter, she'll watch it for some reason. It's really strange how. I, I, have, think I, that I, makes, I mean, I find it quite autumnal horror. I mm. like to write. I mean, I'm I, this time of year is normally when I would have been writing Lovecraft investigations or mythos or something because it's kind of we've kind of gone out of sync with it a bit, but. Um, you know, now when it's when there's rain against the window and the and the the nights are setting in, that's um, when I want to be dealing with stuff like that. I was reading a book recently about Guillermo del Toro's workspace. He has this house in LA, as you probably know, that's like a museum of horror and Lovecraftian stuff. And he has a writer's a writing room in that. So it's in the middle of LA. So like you know, 364 days a year, bright sunshine and 80 degrees. And he's got one room with blacked out windows and at the press of a button, rain will hit the windows from the outside like <laughs> a spray of water and, and, and the speakers will play a thunderstorm and that's how he sits down to write. Oh, fantastic. It sounds like something out of uh, Wiesemann's and Root, you know, that, that, that very decadent Frenchman who, you know, created this artificial world he occupied. Mm. It's very, yeah. very, very similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So how did you obviously we're um this show we're interested in lovecraft in particular but um how did you sort of come across lovecraft and like you know obviously he's obviously someone that's had some sort of effect on you um obviously he like- has but i think it's not as profound or as deep as people might imagine from the fact that i've done four seasons of something called the lovecraft investigations um i remember being in a bookshop as a kid and picking up they did three paperback kind of anthologies and i don't remember which volume it was i got a feeling it was the haunter of the dark volume actually had a weird monster on the front i was at that point into the pan books of horror that were coming out and uh was it fontana that did a similar thing i can't remember Mm -hmm. um 
And I picked this book up, not really understanding, I don't think at the time, that all the stories were by the same author because they hadn't been. In all these other books, they were by different people. Um, and I remember taking it home, and I think the first Lovecraft story I ever read was The Music of Eric Zahn. Um, and I think the reason for that was probably because it was the shortest one in the book. Um, so uh, that was my intro and then it's just kind of hovered around really um and at a certain point 2015 2016 i think i reread the case of charles dexter ward i have a copy down here that's like a standalone book of the case of charles dexter ward and i read that and it was just around the time that serial came out as a mm -hmm. podcast a true crime podcast and I was looking at Lovecraft thinking not many people have successfully made these or adapted these into anything worthwhile. The HP Lovecraft Historical Society do amazing audio plays that are very much in period, but there wasn't much in the way of movies. John Carpenter had riffed on it within the mouth of madness. And I knew that Guillermo del Toro had tried to get the mountains of madness off the ground. Um, and I was just thinking about how you modernize it and the difficulties and the difficulties with him, uh, with Lovecraft and his sensibility, which was kind of extreme even for the time um, and how you dodge that and stuff. And I listened to Serial and I realized that there might be a way of dovetailing these two things, this idea of a true crime podcast, because Charles Dexter Ward is such a locked room mystery at its core. Mm -hmm. And then it has all of this stuff about the witch trials in the middle of the book that I knew from a bit of research into that I've been doing into stuff like the process church, the final judgment in the sixties and, and the new forest covens and stuff. I was like, we've got that. There was that witch craze in the sixties and seventies here that could be transposed from those Salem style, witch trials that, that he talks about. And that's where it came from. Really. It was like, okay, true crime podcast. That could be a way of updating this and just presenting it as a contemporary case. Mm. Yeah, um, we, actually, we had timothy wiley from the process church on before he died <clears throat> a few years oh, really? ago yes we have an episode with with uh if listeners want to check that out but uh, oh I'll, I'll send you a link and to what that. was he like oh you yeah. you're just a big fan of everyone you talk to aren't you, so, you... <laughs> i think we're just used to talking we because being strange people ourselves <laughs> and occupying a liminal space <laughs> well <we're, laughs> this is the world we occupy <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not it's not that weird to us but uh yeah but uh it's interesting about the the lovecraft influence i, I think he's more of an influence rather he's, like you say mm. adaptions of his work they're they're hit and miss but yeah. um and you can see the influence but uh, weirdly i think one of the most uh in in the media one of the most biggest influences and it's going to sound very strange at first is um is uh, the alien film you know the because the alien monster in that geiger's work is it, it's got a very love viscerally uh, love craft <clears throat> well that. when you jump forward to prometheus the um the sequel slash prequel that ridley made that has a monster in it. The thing with the tentacles that's in the room, I can't remember the setup, but there's a bit in, in the end of the second act of Prometheus where there's a room with a tentacle monster in it that's pure Lovecraft. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Geiger stuff is, and it's, I mean, it's cosmic horror is where the Lovecraft's influence to me is everywhere. You couldn't, there's no Stephen King without Lovecraft. There's no... Ramsey Campbell probably without Lovecraft. There's no James Herbert. There's no, you know, everything kind of comes out of this yeah. um, uh, one kind of point in time. But for me, the thing that I always loved about him was the <clears throat> unknowable weirdness. Mm. He almost I'm less it. attracted to stories like the Dunwich Horror or um, Reanimator and stuff like that. I'm yeah. more into the I don't know what the hell I was just reading that, but you know, Algernon Blackwood is another one person that I love and a story like the willows where you just go, well, that was weird, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> well, funny enough, reanimator, you think that would be because like you've got the, the, uh, the movie zombie, zombie apocalypse type things. That's very yeah. popular. Isn't it? It's not my cup of tea, but um, I can, yeah, I can see that being that there was a, there was a popular, 
uh, adaption of the VAT, wasn't there, in the 80s. And it, it was and that's called Real. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. a gore fest, which was like popular. In yeah. The, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, 80s, I'm, I'm very similar to you. 80s horror films, for me, became very sort of formulaic and they and became sort of a gore fest, which is in and of itself doesn't. In, I don't get enough much out of it, so you know. I agree yeah. with you, but then there are those kind of crossover movies, like the first Hellraiser, which was pretty yeah. gory, but also felt like Absolutely. it had a lot. Of yeah. craft. Well, it served a purpose. It did serve a purpose, and behind that was the uh, uh, sort of themes of of pain, and uh, and uh, and it was more about that, wasn't it? And and yeah. visually representing that on the screen yeah. so no, you're right it wasn't it didn't feel even though it was gory it didn't feel kind of gratuitous because it was part of the story and also with lovecraft he's almost like invented his own genre because he's not you know science fiction in the very sort of uh um sanitized you know you think of like science fiction you know it's spaceships big shiny spaceships it's all sanitized it's got you know men with you know ray guns and whatever and then you've got like the gothic horror and it's all you know spooky mansions and misty things it's got that in it as well but it doesn't really fit in any particular thing those influences no. are there it's a it's it occupies a very strange space quite appropriately enough in uh, uh, which you can't really sort of i mean there's like uh, i can't really remember what it's called now but there was one there's like a hp lovecraft story very untypical where it's set on the planet venus and there's like some there's like this invisible maze on it and this astronaut gets lost in it and there's got these venusians with like tentacles coming out there they don't speak uh but they got these tentacles coming out their chest and they wiggle them around and that's how they communicate in some weird way but that's a good but even that it, it, i mean that sounds you know just saying it like that like a, a very typical sort of you know 50s like or something so yeah 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 but <clears throat> what he does with it is very odd you know it, yeah. it, it's very yeah it's got big... i mean i was most recently my daughter was re-watching agents of shield which is the last place you'd expect to find lovecraft uh influences and yet there's an entire season of that show with a portal to another planet that's pure Lovecraft mm. um, and super weird. Yeah, he, he, I, I loved his kind of mythology. He, he was a bit like what you've done in a way with um, <clears throat> the Pleasant Green stuff. He kind of, he would sort of bleed characters through, wouldn't he, in his books like Nyla Fotep and this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it also that's... he'd bring in, which we haven't done yet, but he'd bring in other writers. So, you know, Robert Blake, as you know, in um, Haunter of the Dark is meant to be Robert Block, the mm -hmm. novelist who yeah. then went on and did a sequel to Haunter of the Dark. Uh, yeah, the, the Shambler from the Stars, I think it was. Yes. Yeah. That, I, I was thinking about this earlier and trying to think, what, did I dream that? Or did I just, no, have I just made I that title it up? EBay. But it sounds yeah. right. It sounds right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah and and also i i i picked up in the haunter in the dark uh there's lots of it riffs back to 1935 which is when uh lovecraft originally sort of penned it penned the haunter in the dark so those little touches were did he yes because yeah. i didn't know that you see that's <laughs> one of now you're having me on <laughs> you're having me on <laughs> so this is something that happens with the lovecraft investigations every single time i sit down to write a series is weird things weird coincidences present themselves. And actually the reason we went back to 1935 specifically for Haunter of the Dark was because I was trying to make the connection between the first radar tests and what had happened at the Blake house. And those first radar tests took place in 1935. Wow, so that was my 1935 reference. I had no idea. I mean, it may have been in the back of my mind because I will have read it somewhere, but it wasn't a deliberate reference to when he wrote Haunter of the Dark. Oh. But that in itself is interesting. Yeah, mm. something bubbling up out of the uh, cauldron the, of, of the unconscious <laughs> or something. Exactly. <laughs> um, one thing I get when I listen to your your productions is, I'm, I'm just guessing here, um, but are you a fan of kind of 70s kind of kids TV as well? Things like um, Children of the Stones, that kind of era yes in theory except not in practice like i yes i've um a friend of mine did an adaptation for audio i think of children of the yeah Stone. yeah for the bbc yeah yeah um and uh which i have not listened to i can't remember if i told him that i haven't listened to it but i haven't listened to it and i didn't see the show i didn't see i 
in theory am steeped in that stuff but I, there are lots of gaps right interesting um but i noticed the sapphire and steel reference in the new oh movie. sapphire and steel i'm all over I'm yeah, all yeah, over. yeah. <laughs> when, I, when yeah. I was listening to it when i was listening to the haunt of the dark i i i, I was thinking to myself well oh, that's a bit like something else uh, and steel then one of the characters then references <laughs> sapphire and steel almost yeah. immediately so that's yeah. a compliment to you the, the... <laughs> <laughs> i love sapphire and steel i was desperate yeah. to do a remake of it at, at one point and i was talking to itv and they just had this was going back a few years absolutely no interest in ever resurfacing that again yeah it's a shame or even a decent book i've said this before (laughs) even like a big decent book a big coffee table book with like glossy pictures and and Mm. like you know interviews and blah 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 yeah but uh, no can you imagine that meeting i just can't imagine the meeting the pitch meeting for sapphire have you met the guy have you met is it pj hammond that's his name isn't it met him no no so um, I did sit down when I wanted to do yeah, Sapphire yeah, Steel. Yeah. I was like, let's get permission. Let's, you know, do it properly. And wow. I sat down with him. And um, he's a fascinating guy. And it's interesting because Sapphire and Steel, and he acknowledged this, frankly gets a bit rambly in certain stories. Mm. And he said the reason for that was because they never knew how many episodes they were going to get. Ah. So they basically keep writing until someone said stop. Um, so, you know, those first couple of adventures are in a lot of ways longer than they need to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one especially, yeah. I think the pace and the number of episodes are difficult for people now to digest. We got yeah. like, you know, we're like gnats in our, you know, we're being conditioned to it with social media to like, you know, have everything Short instantly. Span. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, even the, the tone, even the ambiguity of it is not going to be to people's taste. Because people but you know, know what's exactly really what's amazing about. about Sapphire and Steel when you rewatch it is, uh, and relevant to what we're talking about, is how much they do with sound alone. Because yeah. without any kind of effects budget at all, they make a lot of hay out of footsteps coming downstairs that you can't see and stuff. There's a lot yeah. of, a lot of the spookiness of Sapphire and Steel is on the soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Did you ever hear the Big Finish? Uh, you know, Big Finish, the um, audio I company. Have not. Have they done? Did they do? Who did they well, get? This is a mystery because they did. They released three seasons of it, um, as three set, you know, seasons of sets of CDs, and then now vanished. No mention on the website. So I, maybe there was some legal. They didn't have the rights, did they? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, but it was. They were fantastically well done. Mark Gatiss who, who, who was in them. Get? Um, I've forgotten the name of the actors now. Um, they're quite well known. Um, hang on, I'm going to look this up. This is very unprofessional of me mid-interview, but I shall look it up. <laughs> do, 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 because because they could have had Joanna Lumley, but she probably doesn't sound like Sapphire anymore. No, it wasn't Joanna Lumley. It was. Hang on a minute. Here we go. Audio plays. It was Susanna Harker and David Warner. So, so David Warner, who was in Sapphire and Steel as someone else, wasn't he? Was he in Sapphire and Steel? Was he? I don't remember that. Uh, I can't remember that. I might be completely wrong. We had in something, in Mythos, I think it was, in maybe the third adventure of Mythos, Mm. we had the guy who plays Silver. Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't spot that. Um but I can't remember who he was playing. But I remember getting excited because I was in the same room as the guy who played yeah, Silver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'd be, I'd, I'd um, join you. I would join you in that excitement. In fact, <laughs> uh, I mean, PJ Hammond. I think he's a great. Uh, he's a great. He's a, he's, he's an underappreciated. He's like yeah. uh, he's underappreciated. Uh, the, it did also a few. Another thing I'm a big, uh, a big enthusiast of from the seventies is a series called uh, Ray Obscura. It was called The Ace of Wands. And he wrote, he wrote a couple of those episodes, oh, I didn't know that. and uh, so and those have the hallmark. You can tell straight away it's his stuff if you if you if you recognise it if you can recognise it. And I think got... he should be. I think he should be mentioned in the same breath as Nigel Neal, but he's mm. not, is he? Yeah. No. no, it's a shame. He did a couple of um, Torchwood episodes as well, the Doctor Who spin-off. He um, yeah yeah wrote a couple of those, I think, as well. But yeah, again, he's one of those. I think he's most of his career. It's things like um, you know, like uh, like procedural kind of stuff, like um, casualty and things like you know that is that kind of thing. Probably is, yeah, because you know if you get if you, I mean, I don't know, I I don't know how successful Sapphire and Steel was at the time. 
Um, it's got kind of a long tail culturally in so far as we all remember it, but I don't know if it was actually attracting advertisers at the time. Um, but he didn't get a chance to do another one. He didn't no. get a, they didn't give him another shot at creating something else. No, and he only ran for a couple of years, didn't it? He had a cartoon in Looking magazine. Oh, yeah, that's there true. No, there so you go. That's, that's any sign of... Not if that's be, any... I read every page of that cartoon. That's not to be underestimated. <laughs> if, if, there's a, if that's any sign of success in the world, I... I, I... <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing you do with the Lovecraft investigations is a kind of... We were talking about this earlier um, before the interview was... It, it's almost like you're building a alternative conspiracy theory in a way, you know, or a sort of... Um, it's kind of, could you talk to a bit about that? Did you draw yeah. much from conspiracy theory? It wasn't really intentional, but um, what happened with the case of Charles Dexter Ward, once I knew I wanted to weave in this 60s and 70s witch craze business, then immediately, and you look at stuff like the Process Church, which we weren't riffing on that hard, but it was more a kind of fictionalized version of it. But Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful were involved in that for a while. And it's, so you start to go, OK, real people. I've always been a big fan of James Elroy's American tabloid series. And I was a huge JFK fan, the Oliver Stone film. So I do love a conspiracy theory when it's kind of exposed properly. And it's not just a bunch of anti-vax nonsense. I like, uh, you know, a nice wrap the world up in an imaginary X-Files type conspiracy. Um, and and so it kind of grew out of Charles Dexter Ward of kind of going, well, the establishment would probably be involved and then therefore we can have some establishment figures and then we can start to thread that back. And, and I was in the London Library when I was doing Charles Dexter Ward looking at early magic stuff and early occult stuff. And that kind of got me back to Mesopotamia. And then uh, that kind of invention we made of how the Joseph Kerwin character in Charles Dexter Ward works and being the reincarnation of a Mesopotamian sorcerer and, and carrying that kind of possession entity through. Um, so it just kind of became part of the DNA of the show in the first series. And the second series was never meant to have anything to do with the first series. So we did the first series as an experiment. It went very well. I sat down to do the second series. I knew I was going to do Whisper in the Dark. Um, and I had no expectations that anyone other than the two main hosts would return to the show. Mm -hmm. And it would be a completely different story. And that was the plan to just do self-contained separate Lovecraft stories each season. And then within like a few pages of the first script, it had kind of crept in and I was like, well, the natural thing for them to find here is a photograph of this character from the first series. Mm -hmm. And then this spider web started to kind of emerge. So now I've got like family trees on my computer that go back from the modern day all the way back to 600 BC. And I've got <laughs> timelines that span 2000 years showing me all the different events. And what becomes really great about the process of doing it at that point is that you start to write a new story and you start to plug events into that timeline and immediately it shows you what they clash with, mm -hmm. what else was happening at the time. So when you say, oh, you know, um, uh, Edwin Lillybridge was in Paris in 1925, I'm already immediately like, so was Crowley, so was this person, so was this person. And you start to be able to stitch things together in that kind of coincidental way, a little bit like the 1935 thing. And so it, starts to take on a life of its own and it feels less like you're inventing a conspiracy theory and more like you're uncovering one mm. but also like uh like umberto echo's book Foucault's pendulum it shows you as a kind of intellectual exercise how easy it is to invent a conspiracy theory mm. you know like you take three events and you can you can always with a bit of googling find a way of joining the dots yeah, and it's always yeah. entertaining and it's also quite instructive because you go, oh, God, people believe this stuff. Mm. Yeah. And I yeah. now know how, how easy it is to make up. It's mm. like a sort of Petri dish. Like, like, the internet's a Petri dish, you know, which, is, which has got a culture in it called conspiracy theory. You always say, though, that it, 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 there was an innocence to earlier conspiracy Yeah, theory. Well, I always say that um, before 9-11, if you look at the kind of culture around conspiracy theory, um, it was much more a subculture. It was very left-wing a lot of the time. And it was yeah. very, um, uh, 
it was it was more like a sort of geeky nerdy sort of thing that people were into almost whereas then after 9-11 it seemed it was rip- i mean i think you're right i mean i think there was some darkness to it as well because oh, yeah. i think there's like william the cooper and, the yeah. elders of zion and stuff like that oh yeah that was always pretty nasty but i think you're right like no one, you know, we were all, I'm sure you as much as I was, were, you know, X-Files fans, mm-hmm. 1947, Roswell, the alien autopsy stuff, fascinating. Who killed JFK? All of that stuff is fascinating. But we never really bought, it wasn't mainstream. Like people knew about this stuff, but it was entertainment. And everyone understood the line between real life and this is what Mulder and Scully are investigating. And at a certain point, I think you're right, probably after 9-11, that line got really blurry and suddenly you've got QAnon happening and you're like, Mm -hmm. guys, this is like a bad X-Files plot. Why are so many people thinking it's real? As someone that's, I've been interested in conspiracy theory for a long time, a, a lot more of the culture of it actually, rather than the theories yeah, yeah. themselves. The people are very interesting. Like mm. I, I was always fascinated by William Cooper, who was like a, pr- a proto Alex Jones, and then obviously Jones came along, and yeah. I loved I loved the stuff John Ronson did with um, Alex Jones and David Icke and all this kind of stuff. Yes, but yeah, it was. I think what as QAnon was crazy. If you've always been interested in that stuff, you can really see where they've been plucking. If you look at the kind of narrative of QAnon, you can really just pick apart, you know, well, this was David Icke, this was uh, William Cooper, this was Alex Jones. And it's just been kind of, it's like an aggregate of all of these different... It is. And when you do it, when you do it yourself, you start to see how easy it is as well. I mean, it's like QAnon really didn't. I mean, there's, there's work involved in getting it to take off, but in terms of stitching a story together... Mm. It's as flimsy as Scientology in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, we can just throw some shit into a bucket and stir it up and pour it out and go, here you go, here's a worldview. Yeah. Were you ever uh, were you ever tempted to bring Scientology into the Lovecraft investigations at all? Is that just no, I think a, we've a lawsuit refer- waiting to happen? <laughs> well, we've, we've referenced it a little bit because we did in season two or three, we talked about Jack Parsons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so we... we that we we mentioned L. Ron Hubbard in passing. Um, I haven't dug into Scientology in the show uh, because, like, it feels like L. Ron Hubbard had that moment of dovetailing with the Agape Lodge and stuff in in California, um, and then he was off, and he was kind of in it for the money. He was kind of, you know. Um, uh, kind of bounced out of it quite quickly when he stole a bunch of money off Jack Parsons and disappeared. So I don't know that there's much crossover with Scientology, weirdly. And I find, I on, honestly, it's not a subject I know very much about. Every time I've tried to properly sit down and look at Scientology, I've got bored really quickly. Mm. I think the, dif- the difference in like... Doesn't have any hooks to me. Yeah, I guess the difference between someone like L. Ron Hubbard and Crowley is, regardless of what you think of either of them, Crowley at least uh, lived it and kind of believed it that, that you know the the occult thing. Whereas L. Ron Hubbard, like you say, it, it, I mean he's he's on record as saying the best way to make money is to start a religion. And although having stuff. said that, there was a great story I found about the New Forest Coven, and I've blanked on the name of the guy who started it, Gerald okay. Gardner. Gerald Gardner. Mm. Gardner approached Crowley to be part of the Wicker movement that he was kind of, you know, claiming to 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 be the it could kind of be responsible for the resurgence of. And Crowley apparently wrote back to him going, "There's no money in it. I'm not interested." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, there's a slightly garbled uh, account. Well, it's more accurate to say that Gerald Gardner joined the OTO. Yeah, that's and, it. Yeah. Uh, ah. yeah, and and before he even joined the OTO, he he um, plagiarized lots of sections of Crowley's works, and so it's sort of yeah. So if you actually go look at the sort of the core material, of Wicker um yeah it's got there's whole sections of it from the book of the law for example well right. Gerald gardner Gerald gardner did play you know i think he had was onto something actually but he did plagiarize quite a bit from apparently <laughs> so yeah so there is that so they did actually meet but it was in the last life of crowley's last year of crowley's life i should say and uh yeah so there is there is a sort of yeah but that they that account there's 
you know the, the, there's that as one of those sort of there's it like all, these these fables are often have a little grain of truth in them and the, yeah 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 so there's mm -hmm. there's something there but it's not exactly that's not exactly right but also, you see well, the version that you've got mark which is almost certainly far far more accurate than the version we use our version's pithier <laughs> <laughs> I I do, I do, I bow to I... <laughs> excellent. T talking about people around the end of Crody's life, and I was I'm really interested um, if you know of this guy. Do you, have you ever read or heard of Kenneth Grant before? Yes, but I don't know why. Well, he's he was uh, an acolyte of Crody's. He was his secretary, um, and yeah. sort of took. A, You'll correct me on this probably. He took over the ATO at one point. He ran the ATO he, in England. He, he was responsible. Yeah. Responsible, please note. Yeah. For the ATO in England. It, 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 yeah, at a certain point. Yeah. But he was he famously weaved Lovecraft into um Crowley's work. So if you read Kenneth Grant's work, it's infu it's magical writing infused with um HP oh, Lovecraft. I'm writing that down, right? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, that's that's where he his was... name has come up. Uh, because, but I wonder if I actually just read it in that City of the Beast book recently. Yeah, 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 yeah mate. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah possibly. Yeah, yeah. and he. Um... I'm thinking. I mean, I I'm toying with this idea. I don't know where we whether we'd finance it or not. Um, of doing a Lovecraft investigation special on Crowley. Oh, wow. That'd be good. Because it's something that I haven't. So we're a fictional podcast. And it would be really interesting to me to take a, to do the research properly, do the real story of the life of Crowley, mm. but have it presented by two fictional characters mm. with possibly Eleanor Peck jumping in oh, yeah. to My favorite rubbish character. things and poo poo things, mm. but nonetheless have the research. So we're not stitching fiction with fact together. We're not making wild suppositions. We are actually as a piece of background doing a proper solid researched piece on Crowley, mm. but framing it within a fictional podcast would be kind of interesting. Yeah. And actually in a, in a, uh, uh, Crowley does appear is uh, in one of Lovecraft's stories, the shadow from out of time. And and uh, he he refers to somebody he refers to him but not by name but that's it. he was living at because he was living in New, New York at the time yeah and uh, so the he he does so he does end up funny enough in one of Lovecraft's stories so yeah um, yeah and it's also a bit of a, a, a more book the magician as well is about Crowley isn't it yes yeah yeah mm. yes that's right yeah the yeah yes yeah, right yeah yeah. And it was made into a film as well, actually. Yeah, yeah. They make a movie of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the twenties, in uh, like nineteen twenty. Yeah, it was in the twenties. It was a black and white thing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, well, in Crowley's lifetime, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that must be weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think yes. Yeah. Well, yes, he was. Uh, yes. There's actually as well. Um, you you in the there's a in the haunt in the dark. There's a photograph, isn't there, by Man Ray, which has. Picasso and Crowley in it, and there is actually a connection there, because there is an actual, there is a possible connection between Crowley and uh, Picasso, because they there was a, in France, which is still there apparently, the um, La Panagile, which is a cabaret club. Um, I was there a few weeks ago. Ah, well, uh, Crowley refers. He, he, there's a story. He, he you know, when it, it, being the Bohemian, he was. Um, you know, obviously that was a place he was very familiar with. And there's a story called the Dream Circean, which begins and ends in the uh, La Pana La Agile. Agile. Yeah. Oh, wow. And 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 Picasso, of as you must know, he also was a, a, a denizen of that. And in fact, one of his most famous uh, paintings is called the. The, the 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 quick rabbit the yeah the, yeah the agile rabbit yeah. and funny enough as well the in the in Picasso painting the proprietor of the cabaret is on the stage playing an accordion or something and in um, Crowley's the Dream Circean he appears as one of the characters there you go so <laughs> we I mean obviously the photo that we reference isn't doesn't exist no, no. <laughs> but. Uh, I think the idea of Man Ray, Alice Prynne, Nancy Cunard, those guys all being together at something like the Grand Guignol Theatre, mm. uh, while you can't prove it, the chances are quite reasonable that they would have all 
been moving in the same social circles and would have known each other. Lady mm. uh, Crowley knew Lady Cunard very well. Yeah. 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 yeah there you go. So it's, it's uh, one of the things I love about the Lovecraft investigations. And I think it's actually it's a really clever narrative device as well as Eleanor Peck. I think Eleanor, yeah. Peck's, Eleanor Peck's character, and for those who don't listen, basically, Eleanor, uh, to have, haven't listened to the show yet, but will after this. No spoilers. <laughs> no, no spoilers yeah, yeah. But Eleanor Peck's like an academic kind of character that the main cast refer back to when, and she's kind of, she. but what's so clever about that character, I think, is that she kind of weaves the fantasy and the and the fact or the, you know, the real kind of myths together in this really, really interesting way. And um, I'm imagining you had to do quite a lot of reading to 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 well, write it's Eleanor Peck. <laughs> actually, it's it's weirdly yes on season two onwards. Yes, I did on season one. What that character became, or rather, that character evolved out of the reading I'd done. Insofar as I was like, I've done all this research, and I've got no way to put it in, like invisibly within the drama. There's just pet reams mm. of this stuff. Um, I need the Donald Sutherland in JFK character. I need mm. someone who can just sit down and go, boom, here it is. Yeah, yeah. And so Eleanor Peck was born out of out of me not wanting to waste any of my research. <laughs> um, and then, yes, consequently, you go, now this is a horrible monster I have to feed every season because, <laughs> um, I mean, she's great. She's a great repository as a character for all that research. And she's very, very good. It's it's a personal thing of mine, going back to JFK, and I'm sure you guys have it with conspiracy theories and with X-Files and various other other things in other media. I absolutely love a good chunk of exposition. Oh, yeah, me too, yeah. If yeah, someone sure. is going to thread a story together for me, then I'm, I'm, I'm right there. Um, so I was kind of delighted to be able to do that because no one ever lets you do it on television. They're all like, it's too much exposition. And I'm like, mm. no, it's just the right amount of exposition. <laughs> yeah. sure. Well, she gets a whole episode pretty much at one point. She gets a whole she? episode. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the thing, I mean, Nicola Walker records that stuff pretty much in real time. So, mm. you know, you hit one of those chunks and it takes barely longer than the episode run to record it because it's just... And she's fantastic in it as well. I think Nicola Walker's... Uh absolutely fantastic i i, I loved yeah. her in spooks weirdly she was in spooks she was excellent yeah that's how i met her directed ah. i directed her in spooks oh uh, right brilliant i didn't know that yeah oh i was a big spooks fan i used to love spooks but uh, <laughs> um yeah one thing with um oh yeah this is another thing as well i didn't uh, i didn't know this recently but until recently but um you actually sort of meld your other shows into the Lovecraft. It's like a universe now. It's the Pleasant Green universe it's being called now. It is, it? yeah. It's sort of, there's a little bit of shoehorning and banging with a hammer to get it to <laughs> together because it wasn't necessarily, and it's intended now, but it wasn't necessarily intended then. So you're mm. sort of retrofitting older things. There's a play called Bad Memories, especially, which oh, yeah. have had to kind of relocate the house subtly in the Lovecraft investigations to make it all fit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've always loved that as well. I've always loved... Um, I used to get such a kick as a kid of watching, especially American TV shows, where you'd see crossovers happen. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And I just get so excited that there was a kind of whole world out there with characters moving between them. And so with uh, that's what, like I say, that wasn't intentional. The first season of, of Lovecraft Investigations was meant to stand alone. And then as I started into season two and started weaving stuff from season one in, I started looking further afield and going, well, is there something in Mythos that can be brought in here? And that's when Parker came in and then stuff from Bad Memories became the Blake House and that became a big part of seasons two and four of Lovecraft um so yeah i mean it's and then uh, and then people kind of got carried away there's wikis and stuff now of, of, yeah i uh, found the, that the other day as well <laughs> with, what it was really funny about that is it becomes this circular thing because as i was writing season four i was like what did i say about that and rather than go back to my own stuff i'm looking <laughs> on the wiki because it's quicker <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 that's that's delightful <laughs> <laughs> So I noticed that with the Charles Dexter Ward, that feels a lot more Lovecraft heavy than the following uh, stories. And again, because that world building happened. And I think, yeah. um, 
And it's interesting, every time I feel like Charles Dexter Ward is always the touchstone. That's the one I always listen to before I start a new series. Every time I go, I want it to, I want this new series to be more like that was. And then, and then nonetheless, each time they seem to kind of drift further away from that. Mm. Um, and I think that's probably healthy. Um, there's something about the kind of the birth of Charles Dexter Ward, the fact that that Haywood is reading out a plea for finance at the beginning of it and, and talking about the other podcasts and stuff that we've slightly lost mm. as we focus in on this kind of ongoing conspiracy. Um, and I think if we do a season five, I would like to kind of bring it back to its origins a little bit, which feels like if we are doing, we don't know if we're commissioned yet, but if we do get to do Call of Cthulhu for season five, then I feel like that's a good opportunity to kind of come back to our roots a little bit. Well, yeah, because they've lost their uh, their place of work now, haven't they? They've so, lost it. So they're now a little bit more run and gun and guerrilla, which I think is good. And, um, and yeah, there's a possibility of it being a little bit more meta in the way that the first series was. One thing, yeah, so in The Whisper in the Darkness, which is my favourite of the series so far. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you, uh, there's two major things in there that really attracted me to it, and one was number stations, and the yes, second thing was, number station. oh yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, and, and the other thing was, um, I've I've been recently I've become fascinated with this um, intersection between municipality and kind of the occult and um, paranormal. So like when a government agency or you know something from the establishment is somehow involved with the occult or the paranormal. So for example. Uh, the Monroe um, uh, Institute, which is a, a sort of self hypnosis y kind of uh, out of body experience um, engine, I suppose you could call it, or like audio experience. The government, the CIA were interested in it and uh, documents leaked recently or, or, you know, just fell out of secrecy recently. And yeah, so I and love the, that. We had a, we had like a UFO investigation department in the British government. At yeah, one point, Nick Pope and yeah, yeah. British X Files, and I suspect wasn't nearly that exciting, but. Yeah, but I think that's that's really. I mean, when I listen to that, that season two in particular, that's that seems that feels because you get Parker suddenly appears and you have the you know this kind of the government suddenly appearing in in, in there as well. What, I don't know. I don't know if that's fascinating to you, but to me, I love that kind of that cross. I is think it, it's yeah. I mean, it's partly. I'm always trying to slightly dodge the laundry files because I think Charles Stross did that stuff so well, but. Um, but I've always loved the Department of Works and they kind of started out in a play I did called Fugue State. And I can't remember if they were named or not, but that was who they were meant to be. And then uh, and then they kind of creep in through mythos and then I brought them into Whisperer. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, because I, I, because I feel like if you're going to, at least this is the worldview that I'm kind of playing with in the shows, if you're going to um, ground your conspiracy theory, then it needs to be something that the authorities are aware of. Otherwise, it's just folklore. Mm -hmm. So if the authorities are aware of it, you've got to assume they've diverted some funds to dealing with it, at which point you get the Department of Works and their involvement makes you go, oh, OK, we're now up against something that whether they're on your side or not, it's clearly a beer moth. It's clearly something that, you know, solidifies the idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I also love, you know, I love walking around Whitehall and looking at those all those closed doors and imagining what's going on behind. And you know it's accountancy, right? You know, yeah, in yeah. reality, it's super dull. Yeah. But, the, <laughs> but I love to imagine that there's mm. something interesting happening back there. And number stations, of course. I mean, that's a that, that's one of the great. Those mysteries. are really. I think they're one of the few things that I am that I find genuinely scary. Yeah, same. Yeah. In a way, <laughs> so I remember getting uh, all of the CDs of the Connet Project, who collected all of those number stations, and sitting late one night in the dark, listening to them. And initially, they're just a bit weird. And then you start to picture, you start to go, but someone made this. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. we don't know specifically what it's for. Like, we kind of know what it's for. But 
but then but why have they recorded a kid reading numbers isn't that like beyond the pe- like was that that seemed unnecessary yeah yeah and it could i mean it could be something completely mundane but it feels yeah. like it feels there's just something spooky about them i don't there's know what something it is really yeah. otherworldly about it isn't there it's yeah, something yeah. just quite bizarrely strange in a in quite a tangible way whereas you know we can read all about the occult and mysteries and there's belief involved in that and there's imagination involved in that but this is just a thing you can put on your headphones and go this exists yeah. people are weird yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's more accessible yeah yeah brilliant anyway thank you so much for giving us some of your time thank you very much indeed guys yeah.